Hello there, friends. This is Spencer Michaud, and today we're going to be talking about Mars moving through the second decan of Gemini. We're going to start out with a very wide angle lens viewpoint of Mars. We're going to take a look at its synodic cycle and where we are within Mars's synodic cycle right now. Then we're going to focus in on some of the specific aspects of Mars when it is moving through the second decan of Gemini. We'll talk a little bit about the mythology associated with Gemini 2. We'll tell you the story of the twins and the story of um, the daimon associated with Gemini 2. And we will then do an I Ching reading to tie a bow on it and find out how we can uh, unpack the essence of this and um, take some some well thought out actions that will lead us to, um, well, lead us to wherever we're going, you know, <laughs> wherever you're heading, we'll, we'll see where we're going to go. All right, so let's take a look at this here. I hope you're all doing well. Um, I have been really, I've been busy with these videos lately. I took the day off yesterday. I, j I tried to get this out yesterday. And my body was just like, nope, you've done videos six days in a row. <laughs> I was like, sorry, bud. And my brain was like, nope, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna cooperate with you today. But but after a day of rest and uh, you know, a little bit of relaxation, here we are. So what we are looking at on the screen here is a map, a astrological. Uh, chart of the heliacal setting of Mars uh, in 2019. So this is um, a the almost like a beginning point for this Mars cycle that we are experiencing right now. Uh, we will see the the actual quote unquote beginning of this cycle with Mars's Kazemi or conjunction with the Sun. But I did want to show you just. One part of the synodic cycle here, synodic cycle means the, the planet's relationship with the sun. And I've been finding over the last week or two here, some very important uh, synchronicities with these outer uh, superior planets, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn, and like current events. And I've been really what I did yesterday was I went through my journals and was looking at these dates and seeing if anything Mars-like was popping up in my journals, and sure enough, there was all sorts of martial conflicts that were popping up in my my personal life, I guess, around these periods of time. And I thought that was uh, very fascinating. And um, I was finding the exact same things with Jupiter and Saturn as far as world events go. Uh, I was looking at some of the current events or world events to find Mars significations, but what I found through that, and this maybe this is a you know a testament to the the human condition, but I found that there were things like wars and conflicts pretty much every day. You know, you can go um, on. There's a Wikipedia portal, a current event portal, where you can see the most important events, you know, in the world over the course of each day, and um, a lot of things that were coming up with this Mars cycle where it was the war in Afghanistan and a lot of like car bombs and things like that as far as a more universal type of thing. But a lot of those things have been coming up, uh, you know, daily. So like I said, I think part of the human condition is, is to love, but also to go to war with one another. So that may be part of the theme today too, is, is reconciling that duality that we have these competing kind of you know, modes of operation as human beings. We want to come together. We want to split apart. We want to come together. We want to split apart in this endless cycle of coming together and splitting apart. So that that's my first statement on, on kind of my findings with this Mars exploration. Um, but this was the heliacal setting. And this is the beginning of what we call the lying, the lying hidden phase. Okay. There is this point when these planets are within 15, be, uh, 15 degrees of the sun, where Mars becomes uh, invisible. And this is sort of like the, the, the setting, the heliacal setting. I wanted to show you this because we will be experiencing another heliacal setting towards the end of this year. Mars generally completes 
uh, one complete synodic cycle in about a two-year phase. So we have to kind of look back to this to, to understand what we were uh, experiencing here and figure out what we're going to be doing moving forward. So, you know, this, this can represent Mars becoming weak and like taking to its sickbed. There's probably some event that you experienced around this period of time that can speak to the ending of the old Mars cycle that started somewhere in 2017. I went back and looked at that period of time in my life too, and it was it was a difficult one for me. Um, but I think that I definitely saw some uh, events that linked back to that, that difficult beginning uh, that were seen as endings in my personal life. And I won't expand on that too much here, but I, I did want to make you aware that they these all have connections. And, I, and I, that's why I wanted to take the wide angle lens view first before we get into the specifics of the second. Um, so as we as we move forward, and I want to look show you some other dates here. If we move forward to uh, the first of September, you can see that Mars here is coming closer into conjunction with the sun. And on September the 1st, we see that we have the Kazemi moment. So there it is right there at about nine degrees, about nine degrees of Virgo. Okay. September 1st, September 2nd was around that period of time. 2019 is what I'm talking about, two years ago. Um, again, without expanding on it, there was definitely a specific event in my extended family that that was uh, that brought up a lot of anger in me <laughs> brought up a lot of like conflict and things like that I was looking at my journals and I was like wow I was really I was really angry at these these uh, Mars Fossus moments and I was like that makes a lot of sense because we're de we're dealing with the planet of anger severing separation conflict and these were concentration moments of, of conflict it's not that you know I experience conflict all the time in my life it's just that there are certain moments in our life where the conflict, um, archetype speaks a, a lot louder. And I think that these Mars significations are definitely those moments, those, these Mars Fossus moments. And I do sort of think through my explorations that even though Mars is a, uh, considered a superior planet, I'm, I think that it has a little bit more, um, I've found in my research that it has a little bit more of a personal touch to it than the planets like Jupiter and Saturn. Not that we don't experience personal issues with Jupiter and Saturn making fossil moments, but I think that we may feel this one a little bit more intense with, with Mars as far as being a little bit more personal. Whereas I did see very big events that were social with Jupiter and Saturn, synodic cycle moments or phasis moments. So that's something to look at in your own life. Again, I really highly encourage you to, to keep a journal. Uh, if you want to be a, uh, a competent astrologer, or if you just want to learn more about your life, really, that's, that's the key, is connecting these astrological events with, with events in your life can, can really give you some insight that you wouldn't normally have by just studying this stuff out of a book or um, in the theoretical realm. You have to ground this knowledge. And the best way that you can do that is through your own experience. All right. So here we have the, the, the core moment. So looking at September 1st or September 2nd, 2019, if you have a good memory, go back to that period of time, look at the Virgo area of your chart and see where this current Mars cycle that we're still playing out could have been seeded. Okay. As we move forward in the Mars cycle, and I go through, through this a little quicker here, uh, you will see Mars start to separate, still in the lying hidden phase. And once it, we get to October the 16th, we do have the heliacal rising of Mars at about seven degrees of Libra. Okay. And this is a point where Mars becomes visible. It is the, the beginning of the morning star phase of Mars, which is a, a little bit of a difficult phase for Mars because it, it is of the di the nocturnal sect. It does better in the nighttime sect and as an evening star because some of its malefic qualities, some of its very extreme heat is uh, lessened by being in the nighttime, being in the coolness of the nighttime. 
the moistness of the nighttime can mitigate some of the dryness of Mars too, if we think about it in a, from a medieval perspective. I also remember this date. Uh, I had a I had a a challenging moment a couple years ago. I don't. I probably have said something about this on my channel if you've been watching over the years. But I was a uh, my daughter was involved in swimming, and I was getting really intense around this period of time about being kind of the I don't know the swim dad, and I was you know having some moments of um, hubris around that where I was imagining, you know, her destiny, <laughs> like as any parent sometimes falls prey to when your kid is successful in something and taking an interest. If you're an intense person, sometimes you can project some of your feelings and your intensity onto your kid and onto your relationships. And um, I think that at that point, I had a really uh, a humbling learning moment. I got in a conflict with uh, some people that were involved with my daughter's swim team and I, I got banned from swim practice <laughs> at the at the heliacal rising of mars um in this cycle and i'm laughing because i'm looking back and i was like i just think about how ridiculous that was and how like uh, really unimportant um my viewpoint was at that point and how misplaced my intensity was at that moment. Um, like I said, it, it's a learning experience. I, I, I am not a perfect human being. I am a very competitive person. And I, I was very competitive when I played sports when I was a kid. Um, I've said on this on various platforms that I was like the I was like the Rudy kid, you know, I wasn't the biggest, I wasn't the fastest, but I was going to outwork or out hustle every single person like I was a cr crazy person as far as sports was concerned I was throwing my body around and putting it on the line routinely trying to prove myself you know and that's what I realize now that it was this deep deep desire to prove that I was worthy and I think that a lot of us that have some trauma growing up and have some challenges with like some of our parents and maybe some abandonment issues I know that as a kid I had some difficulty through um, being a child of divorce and some of the issues that came up with that, that we may, you know, feel this deep desire to, to prove ourselves. And that was really strong in me. And, and it, it really came out in athletics. I was able to channel those feelings through sports. And um, for the most part, it was healthy. It was a healthy outlet for my, my anger and for my like, you know, martial tendencies. Um, but you have to realize, and I've said this in other videos, that there are appropriate uh, outlets and there are things where they're not appropriate. You could see that Mars here at this a chronicle, or I'm sorry, the heliacal rising was in Libra. So I was getting angry on behalf of some someone else. You know, I was getting angry because uh, someone else wasn't working. I, this was the dumbest thing. I, I, I got really upset because I didn't feel like um, my daughter's teammates were working as hard as she was, and they had given her some crap about w working hard. And I kind of, it, this had been bubbling up for a long time, like I was observing practice and um, people were almost making fun of my daughter for w working hard. And I, I kind of got fed up with it one day and like just blew up, you know, because I really appreciate my daughter's work ethic. And I've been trying, I tried to instill in her a work ethic. And when I saw that people who were in positions of authority that were trying to tear her down for the work that she was doing while they were not uh, not working as hard as her, I, it, as my parental, you know, mother bear type of energy just, just came out. But it was, like I said, it wasn't my job. It, it, I wasn't the coach. I wasn't in a position of authority. It was an inappropriate use of my, my um, I don't know defense mechanisms. And I really had to learn from it. I, I had to take a big step back. I had to refocus on my own um, stuff and not project that intensity out into a relationship where it wasn't, um, you know, it just wasn't my, wasn't my place. And I tell you, I, I tell this story because I really think it's important to learn from these things. And um, 
hopefully by showing you a point in my experience where I experienced a real, a real humbling, this can, I want you to look and see if there was anything like that in your life. Leave me a comment. Did you have any challenges around this period of time, mid-October 2019, where maybe there were some, some difficult relationship issues and some challenges? Uh, and we can really learn from it, I think. Uh, we're always learning from these things and, and how can we do better the next time we're faced with a situation like this. And hopefully, uh, I, I definitely have learned from it. My, my intensity is now channeled into making these videos <laughs> like it's something that I could, I can control instead of like projecting um, my competitive or like creative nature onto someone else, right? I think that's Whenever we can own something, that's important. And I think that that's really important for Mars and Gemini here too, is because there is some themes of projecting our anger out onto some other, some other outer figure that we can consider our shadow, right? And when it's really something that we need to integrate within ourselves. So just to take you through these, uh, this Mars phase, we, we see, and I'm going to go a little faster now. That, so those moments, the heliacal setting, the Kazemi moment, the conjunction with the sun, and then the heliacal rising were, were really important moments at the beginning of this Mars phase, okay? And as we move forward, we can see that Mars is separating through its morning star phase. It's having this distance from the sun. And what we're seeing here is we are seeing as we get closer to the uh, trine with Leo and Mars, Mars is now in Aries, okay? Through closer to the trines with the outer planets, we will see those planets turn retrograde. So here, roughly around the Leo time, now I know we see this with the sun moving into Virgo, but it's close to the, to the other fire sign. We see that Mars is about to turn retrograde here on September the 10th, and there it is. That's the beginning of the acronical phase, which is a, a point when the outer planet, the superior planet is uh, retrograde. Throughout that retrograde period, we call that the acronical phase, okay? And there is a period at the opposition where those planets completely disappear. In, with in a seven and a half degree um, arc of distance of the opposition, Mars will be completely disappeared, okay? So that is, that is the acronical phase. And then Mars stationed direct on the 13th of November after the election. I remember this period, there were a lot of uh, forest fires on the West Coast during Mars's acronical phase. Um, we had all of the kind of the lead up to the, um, the election of 2020. That was a difficult, contentious time. Uh, we had some confusion around the election, or we had people that were trying to sow confusion when Mars was uh, hidden. So there may have been some real conflicts behind the scenes. We didn't know what was happening yet uh, as far as like... Um, what was going on with the election with like people counting votes and things like that. People were trying to sow doubt and discontent and all of these things. And then we had, you know, the, the, the direct station. So this is the direct station that happened around the 13th. So that's what we've gotten so far, as far as the, uh, the different phases that we've experienced so far with Mars. Now, what we are going to see then is the beginning at the direct station of Mars, okay, there's the acronical curtail, that's called curtailed passage. When it is exactly opposite, we have a invisibility point, okay? And then we start to get visibility again. And here is the direct station on the 13th. That's the beginning of Mars's evening star phase. So the phase that we're in with Mars right now is the evening star Mars, okay? That is the time between the direct station and the heliacal setting. So we will be in this evening star phase, this wide angle view that I'm giving you here up until the 23rd of August of 2021. So you should see the completion of something that you started in 
the fall of 2019, the beginning of the end of that at the helical setting of the tw- at, on the 23rd of August. So really circle that date and pay attention to what is going on. That'll happen at 15 degrees of Virgo. So we're coming right back to the Virgo place where, it, where the cycle began. And then we will have the Kazemi moment on the 10th, I'm sorry, the 7th of October at 15 degrees of Libra. So that will be the beginning of our next, um, of our next cycle. Okay. So that's the, the big picture view that we have here. I'm, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go back to today. And you can see today here, we have, we're continuing this evening star phase, right? The, that means that the, the sun is rising before Mars. The Mars's heat is kind of mitigated a little bit by being of the nocturnal position here. You can, and we can see it's an evening star because if we put the sun at the western horizon, you will visibly be able to see Mars in the evening. Okay, it will it will start to show up in when the sun begins to set, rather than in the morning hours. Okay, all right. So let's add all of our our stuff back in here, and we'll go through it kind of step by step with some of the conditions of Mars beyond the synodic cycle and some of the aspects that we're going to be experiencing over the course of this uh, time frame that we have here. All right, hope that you're hanging in there with me so far. I'm adding in all of the planets back into view here so we know what we're dealing with, okay? All right, so there is everything back here. Um, We did see Mars move into the second 10 degree section of Gemini, 10 degrees Gemini on the 21st of March. Now I'm getting this, this video out a few days after Mars's ingress into the uh, second decade. I apologize for that. I've just been doing a lot of videos lately. And sometimes I have to kind of pick and choose which things are going to come out on time or not. And for the most part, what I've chosen to do is that if a planet is much slower moving, I'm going to delay it for a few days because it will have a, a longer tail of um, efficacy, right? This, this is a, a video that could be poignant for at least the next, you know, 15 days or so rather than a, a slow, a, a, a inferior planet, which may only have uh, meaning for a week or less than a week. So there is my method with that. So at about 12.26 a.m. on the 21st, I'll go back a day here just so that we can go through it together. All right, we saw Mars move into the second decan of Gemini. Now, the host of Mars in this decan is Mercury. And Mercury is not happy right now. Mercury is in a Jupiter-ruled sign. It's in its exile. It's in its fall. Uh, It is, uh, you know, trying to, you know, find a unified sense of purpose, but Mercury is a planet that, that sows the seeds of doubt. So we're trying to find clarity. We're trying to use our skill set in a way that it, that has meaning. And um, we may be kind of blending a lot of details together. We may be finding some confusion. This does speak to maybe having a more poetic sensibility, more poetic, uh, you know, intuitive sense uh, of our thinking where we may not be thinking really with our rational brain, we may be thinking with our intuition right now, which is okay. We just have to be aware that that's the case and that could be creating some tension um, with Mars right now because that its host is, it's in a square with its host. And that's gonna be one of the big aspects that we're experiencing through this, um, this cycle as well is Mars being in a square with its host. Mars will uh, have a different sign ruler for Mercury on the 3rd of April. So on the 3rd of April, Mercury moves into Aries. So then it'll be in sextile with its host. So that'll be maybe an improvement as far as like some of the, the tension and anxiety that we're experiencing right now. Um, one, one thing that was going on on the 21st is um, we had a trine, the perfection of a trine, between Mars and Saturn. And uh, this has been building for a little bit of time because these two planets are pretty slow, but uh, I, I, I would say that my 
productivity over the last week or two has probably, I can probably thank Mars and Saturn for this. Like I just kind of um, did what I had to do, which is Saturn, you know, kind of uh, giving you endurance to the actions that you're taking with Mars. Um, hopefully we'll all get a little bit of a break here. I, I hope that you've been productive and able to, to put energy into your chosen projects. Um, this Mars here is also hanging out on the fixed star Aldebaran at 10 degrees of Gemini. That's the eye of the bull in Taurus, the red eye of the bull. It, is, it has a martial nature to it itself. Uh, it was of the nature of Mars and Jupiter. And this was one of the, the royal fixed stars of Persia that announced the spring equinox in ancient times around 3000 BCE. It was that rose with the sun at the spring equinox. So this was about new beginnings. Uh, this, this is about um, taking action, but with integrity. Bernadette Brady talks a lot about having integrity when it comes to the royal fixed stars, or you will pay a, uh, a rebalancing consequence or trial by fire. In this case, this, this fixed star was associated with Ohura Mazda and, you know, his, um, in the Mithras and, and their uh, commitment to doing things in a certain way with integrity. So we may have had an integrity challenge over the weekend where we needed to stay true to our integrity or the, the conflict or the consequences could have been more severe. Um, so this may be where we could have been, you know, tempted to uh, have a, an integrity lapse. So hopefully you pass the test and, uh, you know, or continuing to pass the test as today and the 23rd as I record this, where we have the applying square, um, the perfection of the square between Mercury and Mars. I would say over the last few days, we've probably been tempted to get into some challenging conversations or arguments with some people in our life, probably due to just some misunderstandings, probably due to not completely understanding all the details of something, of trying to seek out some kind of uh, unifying purpose, but feeling torn in many different directions. I think that's really the conflict we're experiencing is we, we really have been searching for a animating principle and that has probably led to many different directions that we could put our energy towards. And we probably are still in this phase where we're trying to make choices. And, and that can lead to a lot of anxiety. Really, the, the Gemini 2 is associated with the 10 of swords, which is, you know, kind of this, this card where you see a figure lying awake in bed. Uh, it, if you notice, I can't really zoom in too much here, but uh, on the bed itself, there is a, a picture of a figure getting slain by a sword. And I thought that that fit really well with kind of some of the, the themes we'll talk about with Gemini and the twins, with one twin having to, to die to give life to the other. Uh, and maybe some of the mourning and, and anxiety that we have about trying to eliminate some of the different pathways in our life. I think that this that's really some of the theme of, of the whole sign of Gemini in general is we start off with this eight of swords where we feel bound or paralyzed by all the different options. We weigh them going back and forth and maybe have some sleepless nightmare like nights, like insomnia so associated with this card and with this Deccan. And then eventually we have to make a choice and let go of one of those options so that the other can, can live and we have to breathe life into whatever it is that we have chosen. But right now we're in the middle Deccan where the, you know, the, the duality is strong. We may feel really split in a lot of different directions right now. And that's okay. That's just part of the, the process. Um, Mars will be moving through the terms of Jupiter from 6 to 12 degrees and then the terms of Venus from 12 to 17 degrees. It will also move into its own terms from 17 to 24 degrees. This face is ruled by Mars. Uh, this was a Mars-Venus face. So this is, again, where we have the, the desire to separate something, but also to unify simultaneously. Um, Austin Kopic calls this Deccan the hermaphrodite. We will talk about that a little bit when we get into the, the daimon, which is associated with um, Sibylle. Okay, Sibylle. And uh, we'll talk about the story of Sibylle. I'll read you a little bit of that myth. Um, Book T calls this, this card 
uh, despair and cruelty, and Toth calls it cruelty. So maybe because of our anxiety, we may be projecting out onto someone else uh, some of our internal conflicts, and that could be starting some arguments with people when we aren't able to own our own internal conflict um, or our own internal shadow. I think that's something to consider with this Mars Mercury square that we have going on here and just Mars moving through Gemini in general. A lot of times we can just like lash out at people because we are experiencing this, this inner um, severance, this inner separation of, of the two parts of ourself. And by trying to bring those things together and accept that we may not be able to completely harmonize every part of our life, that can help us to, to own that energy rather than externalizing it. So that's one thing that I will say about this. Um, let's talk a little bit about Sibylle here. Um, there's just a few fixed stars in this decan. Uh, there is Aldebaran at 10 degrees of Gemini now. Gem Aldebaran is now processed into the second decan. And then we have Rigel at 17 degrees of Gemini now. We'll talk about that a little bit as we go through the, the aspects themselves. But what I wanted to do first was before we get into the myth of Sibylle, I wanted to read you a, a little excerpt from The Astrology of Fate by Liz Green. And this is a uh, part of her Gemini chapter where she is talking about the Dioscori, which are the, the twins, the, um, the, the children of a god is what that translates into. And she talks a lot about all these different twins and some of the, the you know, reconciliation that we have to come to with these these uh, light and shadow type energies interacting with one another. So she says on page 190, the twins Castor and Polydeuces, Pollux in Latin, are much better known than Zethus and Amphion and are a pair generally associated with the stars of the constellation of Gemini. They were the sons of Leda, the wife of King Tyndareos of Sparta. Zeus turned himself into a swan to court the lady who laid two eggs as a result of their union. From one egg emerged Castor and Clytemenstra, whom we have already met as the wife of Agamemnon in the Orestia. These two were mortal children, the offspring of King Tyndareos. From the other egg came Polydeuces and Helen, who were children of Zeus. Okay, so those were the immortal twins, right? Uh, thus, there are two sets of twins in the story, one male and one female. Castor and Polydeuces, who are called the Dioscori, which means sons of God, and the Clytemenstra, Clytemenstra, and Helen. Half of each pair is mortal, half immortal. Here is embodied not only the motif of the hostile brothers or sisters, but also of brother-sister twin souls. In the story, Castor and Polydeuces qu quarreled with another set of twins called Idas and Lenesis. Lenesius. Lincius. Sorry, I'm trying to pronounce these words on the fly, and I don't have a ton of experience with them yet, so I'm sounding them out as I go. Apologize for that. In the ensuing battle, Castor, who was mortal, was slain. Polydeuces' grief was so great at the loss of his beloved twin that he appealed to his father Zeus to restore his brother to life or to accept his own life in ransom for casters. Zeus, rather out of character, displayed compassion for the twins, and the two brothers were allowed to enjoy alternatively the boon of life, passing one day beneath the earth in Hades' realm and the next in the heavenly abode of Olympus. Thus the twins reflect a cyclical experience of opposites, for when they are mortal, they must taste death, in darkness, death and darkness. And when they are divine, they partake of the pleasures of the gods. Okay. So we have this inherent duality, life and death, uh, male and female. Um, we have this like need to eventually make a compromise after a loss. Um, and this will bring us to the kind of the experience that Austin Kopic is drawing upon in his book, 36 Faces, of calling this deck in the hermaphrodite. Now he is drawing upon the myth of Sybil, or Sibylle, Sibylle, Sibyl, Sibylle. I've seen it pronounced a number of, of ways. I'm going to call it Sibylle today. 
Um, but this is from the fragmentary text called 36 Heirs of the Zodiac, which gives a specific spirit to each 10 degree decan. So I did some research on Sibylle, and here is uh, an excerpt from Classical Mythology by Mark Morford and Robert Lenarden. This is a, a book that was given to me as a gift by my good friend Cassidy, so thank you, Cassidy. Uh, this uh, says, and this is this is talking about Sibyl, Sibyl, Sibylle, <laughs> Sibyl. It, it makes more sense to say Sibyl, but I think that the proper pronunciation is Sibylle. Okay. It says, Sibylle was sprung from the earth, originally a bisexual deity, and then reduced to a female. Okay, so this is where, uh, in Austin Kopic's book, he talks about Sibylle was born with both uh, sexual organs, and this was intimidating to the gods, so they severed the phallus of this, uh, this deity, and it fell to the earth, and from that earth there grew an almond tree. Okay, so it says, uh, from the severed organ, an almond tree arose. Nana, the daughter of the god of the river Sangria, Sangarios, picked a blossom from the tree and put it in her bosom. The blossom disappeared and Nana found herself pregnant. A son, Attis, was born and exposed, but a he-goat attended him. Exposed basically means like in ancient times, if they didn't want a child, they just like left it on a mountainside <laughs> or some, some BS like that. They were like, oh, we'll just cast this child out. In a lot of these myths, they talk about these children of divine parentage that had these, you know, these destinies to overthrow a parent, um, where they just cast them out and like ex expose them so that they would die. Okay, pretty harsh. Uh, it says, Addis grew up to be a handsome youth, and Sibylle fell in love with him. However, he loved another, and Sibylle, in her jealousy, drove him mad. In his madness, Addis castrated himself and died. Sibylle repented and obtained Zeus' promise that the body of Attis would never decay. Okay, so that's interesting. So he, there is this kind of cycle that happens, like because Sibylle herself was castrated, uh, you know, she maybe projected this energy onto Attis and seeing, you know, this was actually... Um, a projection of her own masculine self, right? It was projected outside of her. And eventually through like, you know, this kind of uh, conflict, she drove a part of herself to repeat the, the act that had happened to her, right? This is something that I think we can really uh, use, utilize to unpack this Mars energy because Mars is a, a planet of, of misfortune, it's a planet of uh, conflict. And I think that going back to what I was saying in the beginning here, when we experience trauma and when we experience inner discord, it is very easy to project it to something outside of ourself. Just like I was telling you with like my inner uh, intensity or needing to, to prove myself, like, like any Leo ascendant, you know, often feels the need to. Okay. I think that that is one thing I've, I've learned with fellow Leo type people is, you know, through maybe some trauma experienced as a young person, they, they often feel the need to prove themselves in their adulthood uh, to, re to receive applause and to receive love. And a lot of that comes from an inner place of feeling rejected. Um, I know that that is, that is something I've wrestled with as an adult is the need for approval. Um, because of my feelings of being rejected or abandoned as a, as a child. Um, and that is something where we can kind of, you know, over and over again, um, cycle back around to and try to act uh, with pronoia and with foreknowledge and with grace. You know, we'll be faced with these situations over and over and over again. And we've all got these things that we are trying to resolve through living this life. And awareness is really the key to all of this. So be very careful about projecting any of your own uh, inner conflicts onto people in your life. If you are in conflict with people in your life, the, there is probably a seed of it within yourself. And to be able to resolve that, we need to be able to maybe either hold the fact that we can be 
more than one thing, that we don't necessarily have to unify every single part of us. We can be these things simultaneously, or we can kind of make a choice and say, well, I'm going to be this today, and I don't have to be this other thing right now. I have to make a choice, right? Um, there's both of those things. There will be times where we'll have to, uh, you know, accept the fact that we can't have all the answers. And there will be a time where we're going to have to make a choice and utilize our energy towards one particular direction. Okay. So um, let's see where we're at. Now, this, this thing with Mercury, with Hermes, you know, Schmidt calls Hermes uh, and Mercury the de destabilization type of uh, essence. The ambiguity of Hermes can be seen with uh, Hermes being a child of Zeus, order, and Maya, the night. So it's maybe some of our ordering principles are in darkness. Anytime that Mercury is ruling a sign in the northern hemisphere, it is a precursor to a change of season. All right, so Mercury rules Gemini, where it is destabilizing before a proliferation of, of summer. It's saying, okay, we're, we, we're trying to pollinate all these different things. This, that's the pollination phase, right? In, in the, the Gemini phase, you get the bees are going from one plant to the next. One plant, one plant, one plant, one plant. I'm going to pollinate all these different plants, and we're going to see what sticks. And eventually, some of them will become fertile, and other things will not become fertilized. And, and that is the destabilization process that we see when we start to, to have unity and to give birth in the Cancerian season of summer. Same thing with, with Mercury with Virgo. We are seeing all these different options. We're seeing, okay, here's everything that we grew over the course of the summer. Some of it is going to be uh, put away for the winter. Some of it has to be returned to the earth. So we're, we have this anxiety with Mercury and Virgo because we're trying to, we know that winter is coming and we know that we will uh, have a, choices to make as far as what, what is going to sustain us through those more lean months. And we have to work really hard at the end of summer to, to uh, salvage and to store everything that we've worked so hard to create. Like the end of, of uh, Virgo has to do with leaving a legacy. And really it's about leaving a legacy for the, the winter of what comes next, you know? Um, so pretty interesting. So we're casting doubt. We're, we're having some ambiguity. We're having this feelings of being split in multiple directions with, with Hermes and with Mercury in general. Okay. So I think we've covered some of the myths of Sybil, uh, Sibylle, Sybil. <laughs> we've talked about Hermes. Um, we've talked about maybe not necessarily projecting our inner discontent or our inner ambiguity onto others through, through conflicts. We've talked a little bit about Mars trining Saturn and Aldebaran. Um, and that brings us current, I think, to today. And we'll go, let's go through some aspects here. So today is the 23rd, as I record this, Tuesday the 23rd. And we are seeing the, the perfection of the, the V, I'm sorry, the Mercury Mars square. So again, this could be some of our inner, our inner conflicts, our inner search for unification, the doubt that we have, our inner doubt. You know, Pisces is a search for meaning. It begins with leaving material success behind, going off into the frontiers of our imagination and trying to create something new from, you know, the divine part of ourself, okay? And when Mercury is moving through this, excuse me, this sign, we may have some doubts about where we're going and what, we're, what our purpose is. And that could be creating some external anxiety, some sleepless nights, some, some ambiguity. It could be creating conflicts with others because maybe others have some expectations for us. Or we could be projecting our own issues onto them, our own self-doubt and, uh, you know, blaming people. I think blame is something that I would expect to see with Mars and Gemini too. Uh, or Mars and Gemini in general is gossip, blame, conflict, uh, not really going to the real source of things, which is our, our, you know, our feelings of, uh, I don't know, a part of us being separated, right? Like Sibylle, like, like having this, this ability to take 
um, phallic action in the world, we're cut off from that. And all we're left with this feminine receptivity and we're, we're desperately trying to regain that agency that we could think of with like a, an archetypal uh, yang energy, okay? So that's really, I think, where the unification comes in is we are, it's almost like we're not able to take action on, on, on our beliefs at this point. And we feel tension with that. But I think patience is the key. We're, we're getting close to that moment. That, that moment's going to come when we either accept the ambiguity within ourselves um, or we let one of the options go and, and really put our energy towards what is in our hearts right now. Okay. Um, on the 26th, let's move forward to the 26th of March. On the 26th, we are going to see Mars conjoining the North Node. So all of this that I've been talking about, the confusion, the proliferation of options, maybe some conflicts that we've been projecting to other people are going to increase. <laughs> like They're going to be maybe blown out of proportion. And this is actually coinciding with Venus's Kazemi with the sun at six degrees of Aries. And Mars is hosting that sun and, and Venus right now. So this is an important moment where this proliferation of options is, is feeding this um, new start that we're trying to make, this action that we're trying to take to differentiate from the parent plant that we see in Aries 1, where we're trying to create a, a dominion, a new, um, I don't know, colony or something like that. I, I hate to use colonization metaphors, but that's the way that they described it in the, uh, the Rider Waite Tarot was you know, this kind of like establishment of a new territory. And maybe we can find a better metaphor for that so that we don't keep perpetuating that, that model. Um, but again, some of this is archetypal. It doesn't necessarily mean that we have to go out and like, you know, conquer some kind of actual physical territory. This could just be about establishing our own individual place in the world that is separate from uh, you know, the, the unified whole. Okay. So be careful of your anger increasing with the North node. Um, be careful that your desire to make a choice doesn't lead you into like, you know, pursuing too many things. This could be where you're scattering your energy in too many different directions is really, I think the, the key with this, look at the Gemini area of your chart and realize that you're just not going to be able to do everything with that. Uh, and that's, that's okay. That's okay. I, I, you know, you don't need my permission, but I give you permission to to take a break. <laughs> I took a break yesterday. Um, I had to turn down something that that I wanted to participate in, but I just was just too overwhelmed, and I knew that I wouldn't. The qual I knew that the quality of my thought process and the quality of my work was not going to be able to be sustained if I um, didn't rest and do some research and do some reading instead of you know, externalizing my process. I needed to refill the well a little bit yesterday. So make sure that when you are doing this Aries cycle stuff, that you are, you know, breathing. I think that's important. We take in and we exhale. We inhale and exhale, inhale and exhale, inhale and exhale. So even when we're in this very young Aries period of time, uh, you know, yeah, we'll have to make some real uh, forceful, energetic moves. But even even us, you know, even the Aries folks out there got to rest every once in a while or you just burn out and you won't be able to sustain what you've started. Okay. Okay. So that is the North Node conjoined Mars on the 26th. Now we'll also be heading to a full moon around this period of time. So you will see the full moon on the 28th right? This opposition here, Mars is in sextile to the sun and Venus, and it is in a trine with this full moon. So maybe we'll be able to find the right balance point here. Um, Mars is also in a trine with Saturn and Jupiter. So some of the more long range plans that we are trying to implement, um, we may be able to take action from, from that position a lot better with Mars and Gemini now than we were when Mars was in Taurus and that square and we felt like we had our foot on the brake. Uh, and that that was probably frustrating. Now, as we get to March, I'm sorry, April 1st, you can see that 
we will uh, be experiencing around April 1st and 2nd, Mars will be hanging out on the fixed star Rigel. There it is at 16 or 17 degrees of Gemini. Now, if I go to my star chart real quick here, let's see if I can take you there. I'll take you there. Do, 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 do. Help me. Okay. So here is, hopefully you can see that. Here's Rigel. Now, this is the a fixed star that is in the foot of Orion. And it is right dipping its toe in this river, the Eurydonis. Okay. And this river eventually will be, this is a river of knowledge, a river of experience that ultimately ends up around the, the area of the sky where we see Hercules, which is in the Sagittarian stars or the Sagittarian area of the Zodiac. And uh, this is the journey from the, the, the boorish, raw, instinctual hunter to the more refined, humble, kneeling Hercules. Hercules was called the kneeling one, and he was kneeling uh, before the gods in, in humility. And, you know, this is where we're stopping our raw, instinctual nature, and we've got this more refined uh, way of going about things that we've earned through uh, many experiences. So Rigel here is the beginning of that journey. It's like the fool stepping off the cliff and start starting the, uh, the journey from ignorance to, to, to wisdom. And one thing I've experienced with Rigel, uh, Brady talks about Rigel as being the, a teacher star, uh, an educator. Um, I've said in the past that, you know, I personally have Venus dead on Rigel in my 11th house in Gemini uh, in my natal chart. And um, so what is a, tr I, I have things that are just coming to me, like information is just coming to me all the time, all the time. I, and I would say that Rigel's energy is, I've compared it to that movie, UHF, uh, where, you know, Cosmo Kramer's character, I can't remember his name, Michael something, uh, is, is <laughs> there's this little dude. Uh, they have all these wacky shows on there uh, that they could do because they were this little cable access channel competing with the big networks. And there's this little kid and, uh, you know, Cosmo Kramer's character goes up to him and is like, you found the marble in the oatmeal. You get to drink from the fire hose. And the kid's like, yay. And he, he picks him up and like sets him down in front of the higher fire hose. And he just like turns it on. And the kid just flies back. And that's what I think of when I think of Rigel now is like, we're just sitting in front of the fire hose of like, of information, of experience, of like thoughts and I often feel like I'm just drinking from the fire hose of all these different things, and I'm trying to bring them into harmony. So, so with Venus there, I, I personally am trying to make sense of all of them. And because Venus in my chart is squared to all the Virgo planets in my chart, I'm trying to weed out all of the uh, information and bring it into something that we can pass on as a legacy um, for, for finding meaning, right? So there you'll understand what I'm experiencing on the daily. But with Mars here, it's a different, a little bit different experience. We may feel con more conflict because of all the different things that of the fire hose experience. We maybe feel, felt like we're knocked off of our personal equilibrium with Mars on Rigel here because of just this, the flood of information that is coming at us and the flood of experience. And that could really cause some of those sleepless nights that we see in the Nine of Swords, the, the insomnia type of stuff, okay? So that's what's going on uh, on the, let's see, what was the date here again? I'll go back to my, my natal chart or the chart. That's around the April 1st and 2nd, so beginning of April. Try to relax, you know, try to... to uh, Turn the volume down on some of the information that's coming your way. Weed it out. Shut off your phone for a little while. Get off social media for a minute. You know, take a break. Go outside. Take a walk. It's probably going to be beautiful out. Get to a, a peaceful, uh, natural place. And, um, you know, you'll, you'll figure it out. As you move forward on the this, we see on the third. Now, this is interesting, right? Right after Rigel, where we're just like, 
getting inundated with all this stuff. Mercury changes signs. Whoops, I went way too fast. Mercury changes signs uh, from its exile and its fall in Pisces to Aries, where it is co-present with the sun and with Venus. So this is an improvement for Mercury where, we're, where we probably have gained some clarity. We've made some choices and we're ready to kind of take some action and get to it. Okay, so this may be a nice uh, alleviation of some of the tension that we've been feeling over the course of the Mars and Gemini 2 cycle. On the 6th of April, we will see a trine between uh, Mars and Venus. I'm sorry, not a trine, a sextile. A sextile between Mars and Venus. So a helpful sextile. Sextiles were of the nature of Venus. So some kind of harmonization between our Venusian desire and our ability to make choices and take action. And Venus will be moving right at the degree of the sun's exaltation. So this may be a time where we are finally kind of figuring out how we're going to create this individual thing that we wanted to create and establishing ourselves as this new uh, sovereign entity and being able to kind of govern our own um, individual part of the world. Okay. All right. So those are all the aspects that we see over the course of Mars and Gemini 2. Let's finish off our talk today with doing an I Ching reading. So I always like to draw an I Ching reading now for our decanic videos. And today, interestingly enough, I pulled the hexagram 16, which is enthusiasm. Now here's some cool synchronicity. I did an I Ching reading for Mars in Gemini 1. And what I received was the hexagram 51 shock changing to 16, enthusiasm. So the I Ching has this really nice sense of humor where it's like, okay, we're going to pick off where we left off and <laughs> change to something else. Okay. So we may have experienced over the, the course of, of Mars and Gemini 1, some sort of, you know, shock, shocking awareness that causes us to feel either an anxiety or causing us to, to split our awareness in multiple different directions. And now we have this enthusiasm that we are experiencing because we may have been getting in touch with this animating principle. Okay. So 16 is thunder above the earth. Okay. This is like uh these are this is the word the names of the trigrams. So we have these two trigrams coming together, thunder above the earth moving to wind or wood. They call some call it wood, some call it wind. The general gist of wind and wood is flexibility above the mountain. All right. So 16 is kind of this energy where we are using our enthusiasm to break through, right? This is, think of this energy as the energy that the, the little sprout has to have to break through the, the surface of the soil and, and make this new start that we're all trying to, to manifest. Um, this is a, uh, a hexagram that follows 15 or humility, uh, which is also called integrity. So once we get in touch with our integrity, we know who we are and we don't try to do more than, um, we don't try to be something that we're not, that, that, that essence and that energy naturally begets enthusiasm because we say, oh, this is who I am. Now I'm going to share this with the world. Now I'm going to take action based on knowing who and what I am and what I want to do. So that, that is a natural um, cyclical type of following of humility and integrity, number 15. All right, so Hillary Barrett says, what do you imagine? What inspires you? How can you use your enthusiasm constructively? Now we do have a number of changing lines here, four changing lines, all up in kind of the upper hemisphere here in maybe the ideal realm, not necessarily just on the physical realm. So this, this really speaks to a crisis of consciousness. One of the things that I've, uh, learned about Gemini is that it is the 12th house of the cosmos in the Thema Mundi. And the 12th house had some significations with um, self-undoing with, you know, it was a place where we may 
be overthinking things and, and it was the place of bad spirit or the bad daimon where there may be a little voice on our shoulders that are, is, is casting doubt on what we are doing. So a lot of these Gemini cards have to do with internally generated obstacles that we need to move, move on from. One thing I like to, a story I like to tell with the 12th house Gemini Thema Mundi is there is a myth in the story, the myth of Ur in, in Plato, uh, where he speaks about choosing lots before we are born. 12th house had some significations with the time before birth because it is the house that is that was on the horizon before the, the ascendant emerged. So they, they had some significations of being pregnant, childbirth, labor pains with this house, 12th house. So these are labor pains we're experiencing here, right? And when we're choosing lots, we may have this anxiety about, oh my God, we've been given these lots. Now we have to choose from them. So in that myth of Ur, you, you were given a number of things to choose from. You couldn't choose exactly what you wanted. You, have to, you had to choose from these different options. But again, you had to make a choice and then you incarnated into a body. And imagine the anxiety of pre-birth where you're like, oh man, I have to choose this life and all of these lessons and I understand the suffering that I'm about to head into and the, and the joys and the beauties I'm about to head into. And there's probably some anxiety in that moment where you know that you, you know, you have to leave this, um, I don't know, the womb, the cosmic womb, where you're probably feeling spiritual and you're probably feeling this unified oneness with the divine. And you have to leave that to, to incarnate into a body to maybe learn something else, learn a new lesson, to have an experience. And there may be some resistance to that. And I think that's really part of what we're seeing with our our enthusiasm here is maybe we're resisting a little bit this new new circumstance, this new experience that we know we have to do, but it's going to make changes in our life. It's going to, there's going to be some ups, there's going to be some downs and there, you know, we're going to have to accept all of it, you know, like, and live it. And that's where the, the fear comes in and maybe the self doubt comes in. But again, you know, think about it as just the beauties of life too. Like there's, there's, it's not always going to be negative experiences that we're going to have. We may have some real joy that we experience as well. So line number three here says, enthusiasm, gazing upward, regret. Procrastination brings regret. So this is where we're struggling in the womb and we don't want to, we just don't want to leave. We're waiting for, it says we're waiting for a cue or permission to act, um, which could speak to the nine of swords where we just you know, feel like we just don't know what we want to do next. So we want some sign that we're wants to some fossus moment to speak to us some omen, right? And so the key with this is just just to do something, make a move, make a choice. And even if it's the wrong choice, it will eventually lead you to the right one. But the suffering comes from getting in that that limbo state, right? Line four says source of enthusiasm, great possessions are gained, do not doubt partners gathered together as a hair clasp gathers hair. Okay. So this talks about becoming a magnetic source through your enthusiasm to bring people together and to support your vision. Eventually, as the sun moves into uh, the second decan and the third decan of Aries, this is about gaining a following in the third decan. So we, we will establish our new territory. Uh, we will establish the, the order and the rules and the, become the sovereign king of that particular area. And then the third decan of Aries, when all these planets are moving through that, we will, we will try to use our charisma to gain a following in that, in that Venus ruled decan of Aries. So just, just share, share your vision. Don't be afraid. Don't wait for someone else to give you permission. Um, imagine the possibilities and then act on them. Exhibit confidence, right? A lot of things can be resolved through confidence. Not hubris, confidence, right? There's a difference. Uh, line five says constancy, sickness, persevering, not dying. So this line talked about the anxiety that's created by sticking to your chosen path, the struggle and contradictions that can help you clarify what you really want. Um, it talks about difficulty bringing our dream to life. Again, that, that really speaks to even if we've chosen uh, the wrong path, eventually that'll help us to circle around to the right thing. Sometimes the negative experiences in our life can really uh, clarify what it is that we really want. Line six says, enthusiasm in the dark. Results bring a change of heart, no mistake. Um, so it says, at first we let clarity in the dark, like, like Mercury providing 
you know, ambiguity. The ch- remember, Mercury was the child of Maya, the night. And we are looking at what the tangible results that we create through our action to recognize what is possible and what isn't. So through just maybe taking the first step and, and testing the results and examining the results, you'll, you will be able to figure out, okay, this works, this is sustainable. This part was bringing me a lot of headaches, a lot of anxiety, a lot of sleepless nights. I need to discard that. And that will help restore right proportion, like Saturn likes to say, to bring equilibrium. So when we let go, this is something that, that in some certain translations we're talking about, letting go of false enthusiasm, we're able to ground ourselves. So when we let go of enthusiasm for that, which is not possible, we can pour the rest of our remaining enthusiastic energy into that which is possible to manifest on the material realm, right? We can go around and try to pollinate every single flower like the bees, but eventually we got to return back to the nest and, you know, we got to return back to the hive. Some of the seeds that we've planted, some of the pollen that we've spread will, will create new flowers. Others will be duds and that's, that's okay. That's nature, you know? Uh, every single project that we try to bring to fruition isn't always successful, um, or every part of it is something to think about. Just because one part doesn't work doesn't mean you have to discard the whole thing. I think this was a key with Venus in Aries. Uh, move, the video I was talking about with Venus in Aries is that you know you can't just continue to start over at all the, you know every single time. You know you can discard parts of something that isn't working, but you have to kind of persevere. You know you know, persevere on something that you've found is meaningful to you. And this changes to hexagram number 53, which is called gradual progress or developing the the wind or the wood on the mountain, the tree that grows on the mountaintop that is growing in a very specific way that is growing slower than it might in the valley, but it's creating its own little microclimate around it. And it is uh, learning that through perseverance, hardship, gradual growth, that it will be able to, to take root on that very, in that very rocky soil. So this talks about establishing your roots, um, you know, being able to be flexible because there may be nourishment in different crags that you have to adjust to, okay? Um, gradual progress was also, there was a Chinese translation of a, a river, a, a slow and winding river. So this may be about, you know, slowly winding your way to your dream and your vision. It also talks about setting high, high standards of integrity. So if, if over the course of this transit, you're being asked to do something that is out of alignment of your integrity, that's where the adjustment can be made. And it may take you longer to get where you're going because of your commitment to your integrity. I know that's been a theme of my life is that uh, I've been offered a lot of sh- shortcuts in my life. And um, I have chosen the very slow path, some maybe even sometimes slower than I, I, I should. I, I have a commitment to integrity that sometimes can be debilitating. <laughs> like, but at the end of the day, I think I'm going to get where I'm going and I'm going to hopefully get it, get there with my friendships and my relationships, my family, and you know, my being true to myself, having all of that intact rather than having made a compromise that, that, you know, brought me so off course that I suffered for it. Um, so try to figure out what that means for you in your life. Everybody's got a different definition of what their integrity is. And it, it, my, my um, definition of it may be different than yours, and that's okay too. All right. So 53 says, what is evolving here? How can you be more patient? So patience is always the key, right? Okay. Have you, have you drunk from the fire hose? Did you get enough Ry- Venus on Rigel for today from me? <laughs> like, hopefully I've brought, brought it into some kind of unified um, field of meaning for you. Leave me a comment in the, in the comment section here. Uh, let me know how you're doing. Let me know what choices that you've had to make. Uh, I always appreciate your feedback. I always appreciate you being here and telling me the stories that, that are happening in your life. Um, if you are enjoying these videos, make sure that you're subscribed to the channel and the notification bell is on. Again, I've been sending out a newsletter once every seven to 10 days, but producing videos uh, much quicker than that. So if you want these videos in, in real time and you're on the newsletter, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Um, I am planning on doing a 
you a Facebook, no, not a Facebook, a YouTube live for the upcoming full moon. That I have that scheduled uh, tentatively here for noon on Friday the twenty sixth. I will be keep keep uh, looking at my um, YouTube channel or my social media for the the time frame on that. I think I'm going to do noon on Friday uh, to do a YouTube live, and we'll talk about the full moon, the sun in Aries opposite the Libra moon. And maybe some of the sacrifices that we need to make to to bring our vision into reality. And uh, we'll 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 check in with one another to see how we've been manifesting that dream that started in Pisces three with the new moon in Pisces three. All right, so that's what I've got. If you want to support the work that I'm doing, uh, you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com. Thank you for for doing that and helping to gift me the the not only the tea and coffee that I need to do this work and to stay awake but the gift of oracular space to be able to be a translator of the stars for all of you. So thank you so much. I really am appreciating, uh, you know, the, having you all as a, as, as patrons and um, you really are gifting me uh, some time to do this work. So thank you so much for those of you who have donated and, and thank you for those who have helped to bring this information to those that might not be able to afford it otherwise as well. When you are making a donation, you're opening up this information, keeping it available for, for those that may not be as, as privileged or as well off as you. So thank you for being a part of that equilibrium as well. All right, everyone. That's what I've got for you today. Uh, be kind to one another. Think you over your words carefully before you speak them and try not to project any of your own inner uh, you know, conflicts onto other people in your life. And uh, be kind to yourself too you know, this too shall pass. You will get some clarity through testing out your vision out into the world. And um, I'll see you the next time. Peace, everyone.